Hi there, welcome back. And so in continuing our discussion of, of fitting statistical models, I'm gonna dive now into uh, the univariate regression, explaining what it is, and as this is our simplest case of a linear model, and then I'll follow that up with a, another video on how we fit this in R. Uh, so this slide shows uh, the basic mathematical model that underlines, underlies univariate regression, or, or really just a univariate linear model, I should say. This is really a univariate linear model, where you have some y variable uh, as a, a straight line of some x variable, so with some intercept beta 0, some slope beta 1, uh, plus some uh, residual error epsilon, and that epsilon is assumed to be normally distributed with mean zero and sigma, uh, you know, variance sigma squared. And so that epsilon normal zero sigma squared was the exact same thing we did when we just fit a simple mean. Um, and in fact, if I got this beta, if I got rid of this beta one x, this would be the same thing we did before, where where we now have beta zero instead of a. So we've now added a beta one x and written down, you know, the equation for a straight line, which you know we've all seen for a long time. Uh, so if x is a continuous variable and y is a continuous variable, this is known as a, a, a univariate regression model. Uh, where we're looking at a line between some x and y. I just also want to emphasize that if x is some categorical variable, if x recorded control versus treatment. So if, if, if you said, you know, all my control data is recorded as zeros, all my treatment data is recorded as ones, uh, then this is still uh, a univariate linear model, but that univariate linear model now de de actually is equivalent to a one-way ANOVA. Uh, so x, if x is categorical, it's the same equation uh, now used now to describe an ANOVA. Uh, and if it's x is continuous, it's a, it's a regression. So it's really a univariate linear model. Okay, so <clears throat> the goal in uh, linear regression is to find the best fitting line between some x and some y when you have more than two data points. Uh, x is known as our independent or explanatory variable. You know, it's our predictors. Uh, and y is our dependent variable or response variable. So when we're ever fitting a linear model, the y's are always the thing we're trying to predict. And the x's are always the thing we're use, using to try to predict the y's. So there's, there's an implicit uh, assumption of causality in the way that linear models work. Um, but it's, they're not actually, this isn't a causal test. You know, getting into the statistics of how to try to do uh, causal inference is more complicated than I want to talk about today. I want to just kind of talk about you know, how you figure out what is the best line. Uh, so I say, you know, you have to have more than two data points for a simple reason. If I have one data point, uh, you know, there's an infinite number of lines that can go through a single point. Uh, you know, many, many options. If you have two data points, uh, there's one line that connects the two. It's kind of, in some in many ways, a definition of a line. And, and finding that, that best fitting line is, is a matter of, you know, geometry and algebra that is not a matter of statistics because there's only one line. Uh, if I have more than two data points and from two beyond, you know, there is no, unless you're very, very lucky, uh, there's no single line that's gonna connect uh, more than two data points. And so the thought is, not, you know, you're, it's no longer algebra. You're not solving for a slope and an intercept uh, given some, some points. You're trying to figure out um, literally, what we're trying to be figuring out is what is the most probable choice of slope and intercept to have generated the data that we observe. So that we're going to invoke, and I'll get into this in the later lectures, we're, we're really ultimately invoking that likelihood principle and asking, you know, which choice of line is most likely to have generated this data under this, these assumptions of probabilities. So always looking at the probability of the data given some choice of model parameters, in this case, slope and intercept. <clears throat> and kind of the key uh, to doing this, the key to, to figuring out the best fit line is, lies in this idea of a residual. And I kind of 
implicitly talked about residuals earlier when I kind of said there was this epsilon. It was kind of the difference uh, between the observed data y and what was predicted by the model. So the residual model is the residual error is again that difference between here y minus th this notation here e square bracket y is read as the expected value of y and essentially is always referring to whatever our model is predicting. So if, if, if our model is a mean, this is you know, you know, y minus a. If it's a straight line, it's y minus beta zero plus beta one x. You know, so it's, we're always calculating the difference between the, the, uh, the observed value and, and the value predicted by the model. Cool. Okay, and you'll note that that residual error is vertical because we're, we're writing on a model that assumes that the errors are in that y direction. And talking about errors and x's is something that's kind of beyond the scope of this first lecture. So we're gonna stick with that classical uh, assumption that we're looking at errors in the y direction. So given this definition of residual error, uh, what is the best fit line and how would we measure it? So one simple, Kind of intuitive thing to do uh, would be to say if uh, if our errors are y minus expected value of y, then let's try to minimize our errors. And so we might calculate the total error by just summing up all of the errors over all the data points, and then ask, could I minimize that? And so you might find a line uh, that you know you know minimize that error and looks great but also point out that for every line that looks great as going through the data, I can also choose another line uh, that's completely flat that gives me the same error statistic. And particularly, uh, you know, if I put a straight line at the mean of the data, uh, almost by, you know, basically by definition, uh, the positive errors above the line and the negative errors be below the line are going to be identical and the total error is going to be zero. Um, and so just summing up the errors, you know, doesn't work. It doesn't actually give you a, you know, a, you know, a best fit line. So we might then ask, what if we tried to minimize the absolute errors? So, you know, it, it, with minimizing errors, we had this problem that the, you know, the negative errors canceled out with the positive errors and we they just summed up. So we could say, okay, let's take the absolute values of the errors that way the negative errors can't cancel out with the positive errors. We just want to you know, minimize uh, the magnitude of the errors. It uh, can also be shown uh, though that this actually doesn't necessarily lead to a unique solution either. So if you imagine, here's an example. Imagine I have these five data points in these black dots. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, this line here is a line that minimizes that absolute error. But any line that goes through this point on the left uh, and falls within that green uh, interval, this overall bright green range, any choice within that space will actually give you the same uh, ab you know, absolute error. And that's because, again, if I move you know, the line up to the upper edge of this, uh, the, you know, the magnitude of the error residual on one side matches the, you know, you have a residual on one side versus residual on the other side. And if I move the line to the other side, the, you know, the sum of those two uh, are the same. So, so in any choice kind of uh, between these two points, the total error is the same because I'm always moving one distance or the other. So, you know, it's, you can show that this, this you know, isn't, it's not that it's not a sensible choice, but it's not always a unique choice. Uh, and one of the reasons it's not a unique choice is because uh, we're not, we're penalizing errors the same, regardless of whether they're big errors or small errors. <clears throat> so another thing that one can do is thinking about, well, maybe what makes a line a, 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 line a good fit is that, uh, you know, we, we, we want to avoid really big errors and we're less worried about, you know, little bits of noise around the line. So small errors aren't, aren't a big deal, big errors are. Uh, and so a, another choice of scoring 
might be something like minimizing uh, the squared error. And here, this root mean squared error is literally, I have this error squared, uh, and then uh, I sum up all those squared errors. And then just to make them easier to understand, I calculate their mean, and then uh, take uh, a, a square root to get things back uh, into a linear, uh, into the same domain of the units. And here, the root mean squared error is essentially a standard deviation, you know, because it has the same essential formula as a standard deviation, except, you know, instead of looking at uh, the difference between y and some fixed value y hat, we're looking at the value between y and, and the, this y hat here is the value predicted by each, uh, by the model. So it's the same thing as the expected value of y. So we're looking at, you know, again, the error, and now we're looking, essentially we're looking at the squared error. And the squared error has this property uh, that, um, yeah, so, so big errors get squared and so they get uh, inflated uh, much more. And this actually is one that works well in practice and it's actually the one that underlies uh, standard linear models and regressions. So I wanna dive more explicitly into what the actual assumptions are under linear models. <clears throat> so first assumption, that I kind of put in the, the equation when I introduced it was the assumption uh, that the errors follow this Gaussian or normal distribution. And that assumption of a Gaussian normal distribution, here is the actual equation for a Gaussian normal distribution. Um, and there's a lot to it, but I think the key thing to focus on is right up here is this, you know, mu minus x squared, showing that, that uh, the, this idea of, so if, if mu is the, what's predicted from the model, x is the observation, you know, we're, we're writing down an equation that is looking at the errors and then squaring them. So this, this squared error, so, so uh, one of the reasons that squared errors show up so often in statistics is because they are the error uh, assumed in a, in a normal distribution. And likewise, normal distributions are, are handy because they have this squared error penalty in them, that they penalize large errors disproportionately. Uh, there's also a few other really important assumptions that are not as obvious that I wanted to go over. So first one is the assumption that the variance is constant, and that's known as the homoscedastic uh, assumption where homo is you know same scedastic is is you know about the variability and that's just basically saying that there's one sigma here so every data point has this, the same sigma some data you know you don't use different sigmas for different data points uh, they all have the same variability so if, if you have a you know data set that has a clear a trend but the, the the variability increases with the trend that's not actually well fit by a linear model because both the mean and the variance are increasing and that violates this assumption of a linear model that the variance is constant there are more complicated models you can fit that relax that assumption and in fact you know if you take my graduate level course uh, 509 you know applied environmental statistics you know we'll dive into how to relax every assumption that I'm gonna introduce right here. Um, and we'll touch on the basics of how you do that later in this semester as well. Um, the other assumption in regression is the errors are independent. So we're, we're gonna end up summing up the errors. And we're, we don't need, in, in the regression, we're assuming that you know, uh, the error at one point doesn't actually tell you what the error at the next point is. Now, that assumption can be violated in a couple key ways. Uh, one would be if you've just chosen the, the wrong model. We'll see an example soon where, you know, if you have a nonlinear uh, response and you fit a linear model to it, you'll have very clear trends in your residuals uh, where they're, they're not independent of each other. Uh, the other place that it can show up a lot is uh, in spatial and temporal data. So in, in time series data, you frequently need to think about uh, the autocorrelation, so the, the, the non-independence of observations through time, that observations close to each other in time tend to be more similar to observations farther apart. And likewise, with spatial models, um, you know, we, we have this, uh, you know, assumption of 
independence is all, that's often violated. You know, with spatial data, the observations that are close together in space are often more similar to each other. Um, it's kind of a fundamental principle of geography. Um, and so, again, those uh, relaxing those assumptions, you know, learning about time series analysis, learning about uh, spatial statistics are things that, that are, you know, the core of higher level courses, you know, I'll, I'll co I cover both of those in 509. Um, Professor Kaufman has a whole uh, course on uh, time series analysis. So there's, you know, you know these, these are more advanced topics of how to relax that assumption of independence, particularly with space and time. Again, really common in environmental data, but beyond a first lecture. Uh, again, there's the assumption that there's no pattern in the residuals, that's, that's really in some ways completely uh, you know, related to this errors or independent part, uh, and that the relationship is linear. Again, if the, if the relationship is nonlinear, uh, you're actually gonna violate both these other two uh, points about the errors being independent and not having patterns in the residuals. Uh, the other more subtle assumption is that the X's are known. So again, we're, when we fit the uh, regression model, uh, we're looking at the errors in the Y direction. And then we're looking at the errors in the Y direction because we're, we're explicitly thinking about a statistical model where we're thinking of Y, our response variable is a random variable following some probability distribution. And we're thinking of the fact that the, X, the X's are known. In the real world, there are many cases where there can be non-trivial uh, observation error in the X's. And again, there are, there are more sophisticated ways of accounting for that, but they're kind of beyond a first lecture. Cool. And these are, these are key assumptions. Like I said, all of them can be violated. Uh, all of, and there are ways of, of addressing those violations in all of them. So I think a useful thing here is, is to come back to Ascom's Quartet and kind of think about um, you know, the patterns we see in that, the, these classic examples and how they relate to these regression assumptions. So the first one, this Y1, is the one that kind of uh, corresponds to our, our mental model of what we're doing when we're fitting regression. And we look at there, they, you know, I can't, I haven't looked at the histogram of the errors, but if I were to make a histogram of the errors, they would probably be pretty normal. Uh, the variance seems to be constant. There doesn't seem to be any increasing or decreasing trend in the residuals. The errors seem to be independent. Um, there's no pattern for the residuals. The relationship really does seem to be linear. And we're assuming that we know the X's. Uh, by contrast, if we look at Y2, the relationship is clearly nonlinear. Because the relationship is nonlinear, there is a clear trend to the residuals. You know, all the residuals here in the middle are positive. The residuals on either end are negative. Because there's a clear pattern in the residuals, those errors are not independent. If I know the error, you know, at nine, I can pretty easily predict the error at 10. Um, and the variance is also not constant. You know, we go, you know, high variance, low variance, high variance, low variance, high variance. So there's a clear pattern to the, the variance as well. So, you know, I'm fit, you know, fitting a nonlinear model with uh, nonlinear data with linear models violating pretty much every assumption uh, that we have in linear regression. Uh, some of the, these bottom two are, are more subtle. Uh, in Y3, you know, it's kind of clear visually that uh, the, the solid blue line going through those data points is not a great description of those lines. And it's because we have this one point that's, that's kind of an outlier. Um, and so, you know, that might be uh, you know, a violation of this constant variance assumption. You know, you know, we have the majority of data points that have very lo low uh, departures from, you know, what, it, what visually is clearly to be the line describing most of the data. And then we have one point uh, that has much higher variability than the others. Uh, and there might be a reason for that. And in, in, in some cases, uh, that is a, a real thing. Um, and you need to account for that, and you need to account for it by acknowledging the variances in constant and writing down a more sophisticated model. In other cases, uh, in my first reaction when I see something like that is to go back and check that data point to make sure uh, it's not just an error in the data. Uh, that you know, sometimes these are outliers that because the, 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 the observations do not pass our quality control, quality assurance. So 
in some sense, we're going all the way back to our data management lecture and thinking about like how to go, you know, checking the, the screening of this data to make sure that this actually was a valid observation. Um, much easier to find out that it was a clerical error in entering data than to build a, a more sophisticated model around the non-constant variance. And then Y4 is an interesting case where um, I would actually argue this does not actually necessarily violate the assumptions of regression, but it is one where you have to see, you have to treat that sort of model with care because it is one where this one point at a high X and high Y has extremely high leverage. So we've got all the data points clustered at one value and you could kind of see, you know, you might be able to look and see that they do in fact uh, have, uh, you know, constant variance, you know, independent errors, blah, 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 all looks great. Uh, but this one point is gonna have a disproportional effect impact on your estimate of the slope in the intercept. I will also point out, this is a very common misconception. Uh, linear regression does not make any assumption about the distribution of the X data or the distribution of the Y data. So, you know, you'll see some texts and web pages that incorrectly tell you to transform your X data to make it normal or to transform your Y data to make it normal. The distribution of X and Y does not matter at all in linear regression. There's no assumptions about the distribution of the data. The assumption about the distribution is about the residuals. And you can only really see that distribution after you fit the line. So, you know, you go ahead and you fit the line, then you look at, and we'll talk about this under model diagnostics, you go ahead and look at that distribution and see if it violates the assumptions that we've done here. So we'll come back to all of this when we get to model diagnostics. Um, but I wanna again really emphasize that uh, there are a lot of uh, remarkably common to find texts incorrectly stating uh, that you have to transform your X and your Y data to be normal. You do not have to ever transform the X and the Y to be normal. You might need to transform Y to make the residuals normal, but not to make the data normal. Okay, so with this, I'll wrap up this video and pick up in the next in thinking about how we actually fit these models within R.